Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jenny Bagan, and welcome to the FEMSI 2020 Taking Bite Out of Ocean, Con uh, Ocean Education Conference. Um, thank you for coming and joining us and making it a virtual conference. Uh, I am the past president, and I was the conference chair for the, for the conference that we sadly weren't able to host in, in, in person. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is not exactly how we do our normal conference presentations. None of us here at FEMSI are Zoom professionals, so we appreciate you, your understanding as we run through this. We may have some technical difficulties, but hopefully we'll be able to solve them all on our end. No, we won't. Ellen says, <laughs> we're not going to have any technical difficulties. It's all going to be okay. So we're planning on this presentation to be about 40 to 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. Um, so it'll be take about a total of about an hour. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box at the bottom um, or at the end if we, um, Ellen will let you turn on your microphones and ask some questions as well if we need to. Um, I put two things in the chat box. One is our giving um, link and I'll talk more about that towards the end and then I also put a schedule of what else we have coming up for the rest of the week. So without further ado, I am pleased let me let these people in to introduce our presenter for this section session, Dr. Ellen Prager. Um, Dr. Prager is a marine scientist and author, widely recognized for her expertise and ability to make science entertaining and understandable for people of all ages. She currently works as a freelance writer, consultant, and science advisor to Celebrity Cruises in the Galapagos Island. So welcome, Dr. Prager. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make you the host of the meeting and you can go ahead and share your screen to give your presentation when you're ready. So here we go. Oops, hang on. Get those guys. There we go. And I'm gonna make you a host. So one, one quick question, Jenny, um, can you still admit people coming in? You know what? I think I lost that ability. Okay, so I'll try and keep an eye open then if there are people that I need to let in. Okay, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I lost that ability when we switched, did the switch. Um, so will it, will it just pop up on my screen saying there's somebody waiting? Do you have the chat box open on your right-hand side? Yeah. Okay, so above that, actually, if you click on participants, because there's 69 in right now. Right. Um, so if you click participants, it'll pop up on the top of that where you see all of us in there right now. And so, but somebody, if somebody needs to be admitted, I can, it will come up, right? It will come up. And I'll keep an eye on it as well. And uh, I'll let yeah, you know. just let me know if I miss something or whatever while I'm talking, please let me know and I'll, I'll I swear I'll let them in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, got it. Thank you. I'm going to mute myself now. Okay. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm so sorry I'm not able to see you guys all in person and be spend time there at the conference but you know this is this is the best we can do so I'm really glad that I'll have this opportunity to talk to you and interact the end I'll, I'm gonna give a just a, a presentation about uh, mostly about the Galapagos and some of the really amazing wildlife and the science behind why the wildlife are there uh, and some of my experiences and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've integrated Science of the Galapagos into my latest adventure novel for middle graders and sort of have a little fun with that. And then we should have time for some Q&A, which I love. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here and um, let somebody else in first uh, and share my screen. Okay. So hopefully now you can all see that. Um, yeah, and so just so you know, um, Jenny, I can't see the, the thing about admitting people right now. So you may need to. All right, we will have to figure that out for the next one. So 
Maybe we'll give it a shot. Um, well, let me see what happens if I click on manage participants. Maybe it will look, oh, wait. Can you guys see that or? I cannot see it. Okay, so maybe I'll still be able to do it. Oh, yep, I think I can. Okay, good. <laughs> maybe it may not be as smooth as usual for a talk. <laughs> so okay. anyway, so one of the things I always like to talk about a little bit is, is the fact that when I first started, I thought I was going to be doing research and teaching as sort of a typical uh, college professor kind of job. And somehow it didn't turn out that way. And I've had some really cool jobs uh, as a marine scientist. Uh, I was the chief scientist for the Aquarius Reef Base, which as many of you know, I know is the only undersea research station in the world that's operating. And that's shown in the upper left. I, as chief scientist, I was actually really fortunate to two missions where I lived underwater. One was for two weeks and one was for one week and absolutely loved it. You can see the outside of the lab and there's the inside on one of my missions with Billy Causey and Steve Giddings, who you may know as well as Sylvia Earle was one of my aquanaut mates during that mission. Um, I also come in very fortunate in that I got to teach for an organization called Sea Education Association. And I bet there's some people here who may have done that program where we spent six weeks on shore teaching undergraduates in Woods Hole, and then we went out to sea for six weeks teaching, teaching oceanography on tall sailing ships. Uh, I've been able to go down in deep sea submersibles. I've done a lot of diving. Um, somehow, and I'm not sure how this really happened, but when there are break, when there's breaking news that has to do with the, deal with the oceans, a lot of times the network call me and I go on air as an expert, like when the Malaysian plane went down, I actually have a contract with NBC. So, but, but the thing there is like, they always call me when something bad happens. I'm like the disaster diva of the ocean. Like, can't you call me when something good happens in the ocean? So I go on air and then maybe a lot of people now think that the highlight of my career is that I got a call from Disney one day and they asked me to be a consultant on the movie Moana. And that was fantastic. And so I went to the studio in Burbank and I gave they had a big auditorium and I gave them a talk. And one of the things they wanted to know was like, what, what should the ocean look like under different conditions? And they wanted to see pictures of like a calm sea versus a, a rough sea. It was so that they could put that into the movie and make it as realistic as possible. And what I, one of the things I discovered is they, they knew very little about the ocean or even ocean terms. So at one point um, I said something about, having the main character land on the windward versus the leeward side of the island. And they were like, what, what's leeward mean? What does that mean? So I was very excited in the movie. There's a line that says, there's a fish kill on the leeward side of the island. I'm like, yes, that was from me. Cause they got the term, they didn't know what leeward meant. So that was, that was really very exciting. And it was a lot of fun to, to do. And I also, something unexpected discovered that I really loved writing science for a sort of a non-technical audience, whether it's young kids, uh, popular science books, high school students, or middle grades. And so I've, I've also been writing a lot of books. But one of the places where I've been very fortunate to do a lot of work is the Galapagos Islands. So hold on, let me, and we hope we got some more people coming in. Um, is the Galapagos Islands. Now, Oh, let's see if this is going to work. Um, the Galapagos Islands, which as you can see here, are volcanic in origin. And this is actually taken from one of the ships that I work on in 2015 when unexpectedly one of the volcanoes erupted. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the underpinning of the islands being volcanic. Uh oh, wait. <laughs> um, so most people, of course, think about the, the, the Galapagos in terms of Charles Darwin and the voyage of the Beagle and the collection of the mockingbirds and finches and how this led to uh, his theory of evolution and the whole idea of survival of the fittest. For me, I actually went to the Galapagos for the first time in the 1980s. And I was there working with a, a team of scientists looking at the impact of El Nino on corals. And back in the 1980s, there were not a lot of cruise ships. There was actually one hotel on the main island. 
it was pretty rough conditions. We stayed at the Darwin station and we were diving all day in cold water. We'd go back to our cabin and we'd only have cold, sulfur smelling showers. And at night, you'd go to sleep and you'd look up at the ceiling and there would be, it would be covered with spiders. I mean, and not just little spiders, giant spiders. And then the worst thing was in the morning, you'd wake up and they'd all be gone. And you'd be like, ah, where'd they go? Um, food was pretty sparse and a lot of times it was kind of mystery meat and we didn't really know what we could get. Our equipment failed. We had all sorts of problems. But we also had one problem that was very unexpected. When you go in the field, you're always thinking about weather, mechanical problems. What we didn't expect was this, sea lions. It turned out that the sea lions loved our survey gear. And you'd be sitting there, you'd put the survey gear on the bottom to do something and they would try and steal it. One time I was diving and I remember I was like looking at my buddy and something started pulling my fins. And I, you know, it was one of these where you turn around and you're like, what's back there? It was a sea lion. So the best unexpected problem in the, you know, feel I ever had, it was fantastic. And here's kind of what their favorite thing to do is, they like to swim right at you, stop here and blow bubbles in your face. And I think they're kind of teasing you like, you know, we're really good at this stuff in the water. You, uh, not so good. So it was, as I said, really, it was a fantastic problem to have in the field. And from that time spent in the Galapagos, I spent about two and a half months in the Galapagos doing that research. And then I had been working with Royal Caribbean and when Celebrity Cruise Lines decided to put a small cruise ship, no, they can't have any more than 100 passengers in the Galapagos, they asked me to go down and help them set up the program. And from that, I have gotten the fan, most fantastic job ever, I think. I am the science advisor for Celebrity Cruises in the Galapagos. And my job is to go down a couple times a year to help um, develop the program on board. I help train the naturalist. We work on the shore excursions, uh, snorkeling, everything on board, all you know, the briefings that the guests get, and it's, it's just fantastic. Right now we're doing some of it virtually and thinking about what the future's gonna hold, but it's still, uh, it's just a fantastic place. So one of the things I love about the Galapagos is what I like to call strange neighbors. So uh, you'll go snorkeling and you have sea turtles and tropical fish and white tip reef sharks, things that you think of as warm water creatures. And then the next thing you know, a penguin swims by. And they are the smallest, the second smallest penguins in the world, the furthest north. But it's just the most amazing thing to be swimming with things that we think of as warm water creatures and then have a penguin swim by. So I'm gonna to get to why the penguins and those other animals are all there together in just a moment. The other thing I like about the Galapagos is that the animals are so well protected by the park that you can get relatively close. You're not supposed to get any closer than six feet, but you don't need a long lens to get up close and personal and get close shots of things like, here you see a blue-footed booby, a land iguana, and that's a male frigate bird with its pouch and its neck blown up to attract mates. It's a waved albatross and of course, the famous giant tortoise. And they're so well protected and so unafraid that the animals will actually they will raise their chicks and babies right either on or near the trail. And here you see in the left, that's a chick of a frigate bird. And one of the cool things you can see there is, actually it's a chick, but it's almost, it's almost at that awkward juvenile stage because you can see the feathers on its back are coming in, but the white is the down that's still there. So it's just growing, growing up there. And that's a, a gull chick on the right, really cute. And of course, the bottom one is a little penguin chick, and it's really funny. I was giving a talk to a group of students one day with this, and I show this picture, and one of the kids yells, yells out and says, he's got an afro. That's <laughs> really cute. <laughs> um, and unexpected things happen. One of the things I love about the Galapagos is you never know what you're going to see, or you're going to see behaviors that you haven't seen before. This was in a place called Elizabeth Bay in the Galapagos where the only thing you can do or allowed to do there is go for a Zodiac ride. You can't hike, you can't snorkel. And so here I'm on a Zodiac with some guests and the sea lion comes by. And even the uh, driver who's there all the time had never seen this happen. Now we're in neutral so that, um, we're in neutral so that the propeller's not running. 
And that's salt water, it's cooling water coming out of the engine. And we've never seen a sea lion do this. Look at that, isn't that funny? It's that we think it is, it's just that they're so sensitive by their whiskers that they really enjoy the feel of the water. And so he's just playing, he's not drinking the water, he's just playing with the water. It was really cute though, that was, that was fun. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm having a little trouble admitting somebody in. Okay, there we go, sorry. <laughs> uh, so obviously most of you probably know where the Galapagos are, but I always like to sort of repeat, they're, they are about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Ecuador is the, is the country that owns the Galapagos and manages it through the Galapagos National Park Directorate. Um, it's an archipelago of island, not one or two islands, and it depends on your definition of island as to how many there are, because there are a lot of small rocks and things that could be considered an island. They straddle the equator, and so oftentimes people think of it as a tropical environment, but it's not, it's not tropical like we think about it. Um, it is one of, the Galapagos are one of the world's hotspots, and there's something like 25 active and dormant hotspots around the world, but there's not that much we know about it. It's very sim it's similar in some ways to Hawaii. And I, last year I created a few two, mi like two minute videos for celebrity. And one of them was about the volcanic underpinnings, or why, how the, the Galapagos are, are volcanic in origin. And I'm gonna just play that for you because I think it does a really nice job of show showing how the islands form. Let's see if we can get that going. Six hundred miles to the west of Ecuador lay the Galapagos Islands. It is a place born of fire, the result of volcanic upheavals that build and shape the land. The Galapagos are the product of one of the world's mysterious hotspots, where deep below in the Earth's interior it is hot, hotter than the surrounding Earth. By this heat and lower density, magma or molten rock rises towards the surface. It flows through fractures already present or breaks its way upward. Once the magma reaches the surface, it becomes lava. In the Galapagos, as in Hawaii, the lava is made of basalt, poor in silica, but rich in iron and magnesium. This type of lava flows faster and greater distances. Over time, multiple eruptions of lava create the towering and wide shield volcanoes of the Galapagos. Here, eruptions can eject ash and rock into the air, which form cinder, scoria, or spatter cones. The lava winds its way over land and sometimes reaches the ocean. Along the way, it creates tunnels or strange ropey surfaces. In the Galapagos, like Hawaii, the underlying hotspot is stationary, but at the surface, the Earth's tectonic plates move and the volcanoes are transported away from the hotspot. Eventually, the volcanoes become inactive and cool. The islands sink into the underlying mantle and erosion and weathering wear away at the surface. Over time, vegetation takes hold and spreads across the islands. Animals arrive and populate the shores. After millions of years, the island's volcanic origin is hidden from view. So one of the really, I think, interesting things about the Galapagos is that you can go from one island to another in a couple hours or over the day and go from an island that is four million years old and like you see in the upper right it could be a couple millions of million years old where it's the volcano is hidden it's well it's eroded very vegetated you can hardly tell it's volcanic but then a couple hours away or a day away you go to an, uh, an island that the eruption may be 100 to 1,000 years old or 100,000 years and it looks brand new. And you can see that with your eyes and they're just 
that you can see by the it's by the direction that the plates are moving where the ions are relative to the hot spot. So you can see that with your own eyes, I think is really interesting. But it's not just the volcanic origin that makes the island so special and why you have such a strange mix of animals. It's also because there's a confluence of ocean currents that hits the Galapagos. You get a warm current coming from Panama, from the Panama current coming down, hitting the Galapagos. You get cold water in the Peru current coming from the south going up and you have a very special current called the equatorial undercurrent. And that current is a submerged current at depth. It flows eastward across the equator and it, at depth and it hits the base of the Galapagos Islands. And what happens when it hits the base of the islands, it's forced to well upward. And so that brings cold nutrient rich water up to the surface and it feeds blooms of plankton. So essentially that, as you guys know, the nutrients act as fertilizer and you get bloom of planktons, particularly in the western part of the Galapagos Islands. And I love, this is a great, let's see if we can get this movie running. This is a great movie from Richard Kirby who calls himself the Plankton Pundit. If you ever need good shots of plankton, look him up. This is just a really great image of, of, of plankton under a microscope. And He's got some, some great stuff if you're looking for that for your classrooms. Um, so the plankton, in, particularly again in the Western Islands, okay, <laughs> hold on, a little, a little, a little, few little glitches here. Um, the plankton is, the, is an important base of the food web in the Galapagos, and particularly for a small endemic fish called the salima. Now, the Salima is unique to the Galapagos. You don't find them anywhere else. They're like anchovies or menhaden or something like that. And they are the base of the food chain. Um, so the sea lions eat the Salima, the, the penguins eat the Salima. They're, you can see, in fact, when you're snorkeling, sometimes you see schools of Salima so dense that they look like black clouds underwater. Truly amazing. And um, the blue-footed boobies, eat the salimas. Now, of course, everybody loves the blue-footed boobies. Look at those feet. They are truly amazing birds. Now, one question that always comes up about, their, about the blue-footed boobies is their feet. Why are they blue? So scientists did an experiment where they withheld food from the blue-footed boobies, and the color didn't go away, but it faded. And so what that means is that when they're healthy and they've got a lot of food, their blue feet are their brightest. And essentially what it shows is for potential mates that they're very healthy. They're genetically strong animals, essentially. And so the, the birds, especially the males, will pick up and show their feet because if they're very bright blue, that means they'd be a good mate. Now, where does the blue come from? It's not like flamingos. You know, flamingos, they eat crustaceans and have a red pigment in it, and that's where the red comes from. Turns out the, the blue of the blue-footed boobies' feet is because of the structure of the feet and scattering, scattering of light. So it's like the sky. Light is scattered by the structure, and so it looks blue, which is was pretty interesting. Oh, gosh, what is my computer doing? Okay, so here is another great video of a blue-footed booby showing off their feet. This is part of their courtship ritual is again, they want to show the mates their, their feet. So they do these, these really goofy sort of dances where they're like, oh, my feet are the best. You must, I'm going to be a stud. Come look at my feet. And then you also have this one. Let's see, the one on the right is a male and the one on the left is a female. And the, the one on the right just did something called sky pointing and they whistle when they do that. And that's to attract the females. The males whistle and the females honk. That's one of the ways you can tell them apart. The females typically are a little bit bigger and they have a different eye structure. Um, many, there are many other fantastic birds. One of the things about the Galapagos is it's not a huge number of, uh, there's not a huge diversity in the Galapagos, but there's great abundance. And here you see a Nazca booby, a red-billed tropic bird, and a hawk. The Galapagos hawk is the top predator in the island. Um, and they, as you can see, this one that was stopping right on the, the, by the scenic trail. They are very unafraid. They like to find high perches to look for prey, but they will, they will fly right near you. They'll look right at you. 
Um, they eat things like the baby lava lizards, snakes, um, some of the juvenile, the chicks they'll go after, but those, they are the top predators. Now, another interesting thing about the Galapagos, it's not a predator prey limited system. So the prey don't essentially keep populations in check. What keeps them in check is resources. When things are really abundant and productive, everything starts breeding and blooming and you think the populations do really well. When the resources aren't there, the populations shrink. So it's not what we think of as a predator prey ecosystem. It is kind of interesting. Here's just a few more of the birds, some herons and flamingos. Here's a, not only do they have blue-footed boobies, they have red-footed boobies too, which are unusual. And there's two morphotypes. You have a red-footed booby, they're the same species, but some are brown with red feet and blue bills, and some are white, like this one. One of my favorite birds, they only land on one island in the Galapagos, is the waved albatross. They land on Española. And they're there from about May to December. They fly in after spending years out at sea to lay an egg and raise a chick, and then they leave. Um, they, so they fly in around December, and then they leave around April or May. Um, but they, that's what you see there is the male or a female adult next to a chick. And they, too, have an amazing courtship ritual. I can never get enough of this when I see them. They're huge birds. They're like two to three feet tall. And they do this, look at this, they, they bow and then they clack their bills together. And you'd see they're doing, they do it right in front of you on the trails. They don't care that you're there at all. It is just amazing. And they're just so goofy. Look at their heads, look like they're too big for their necks. It's truly amazing. Um, oh, and so one, one of the things about the wave albatross, it's, it's interesting, I should tell you, is that for many years we thought that they mated for life. And they may mate for life, but what they discovered through genetics is that the offspring, offspring may not be, that they're raising may not be from the two mates. Turns out sneaker males, when the females land, come in for a little action, and sometimes they are the true father of the chicks that's being raised by the mated pair, which is good for genetic diversity. Sort of interesting. And this is a Sally Lightfoot crab, another endemic species in the Galapagos. They are black as juveniles to blend in with the rocks, and then when they become sexually mature, they turn this astonishing bright red and orange color. There are land iguanas in the Galapagos. Um, and you can see one by its burrow. They feed on cactus and the cactus fruits, um, insects. They're kind of omnivores, typically. Of course, the giant tortoises. Now, the giant tortoises, uh, were, were, their population was really decimated by the whalers and pirates when they came to the Galapagos. They took the giant tortoises off the islands because they don't require a lot of water or meat, so they could keep them alive in the ship's hold for a long time and use them for fresh meat. And so that's one of the reasons why the Galapagos National Park Service has a breeding program. And you can see the babies in the upper photo, and they breed them, and they're now repopulating the islands. And it's great because now we know that some of these populations that have been brought back are starting to reproduce in the wild. One problem they're having is that goats and other invasive species are, out, are competing with them for some of the habitats and the vegetation and have been changing it. The same thing is true is with climate change, maybe changing the vegetation on the islands that the giant tortoises need for food. There are a lot of sea turtles in the islands. You can see a sea turtle here. Um, the Pacific green sea turtle is the most common. And you can see they lay their uh, eggs on the beach, just like we have here in Florida. Uh, and of course, we all know that the temperature determines the gender. And so just like everybody everywhere else, they're a little worried about with climate change, will they have too many females relative to males um, as the, the females lay their eggs and, are, and the babies are born? Um, one of the other endemic species is the flightless cormorants. And here's a really cool, this is their courtship dance in the water. And they swim around each other. It's really beautiful. So in Florida, we have cormorants that fly. But when the cormorants got to the Galapagos, they discovered that there was so much food and very little competition that they didn't need to fly between the islands. And over time, they lost the ability to fly because they didn't need to. And so if you see, look, if you look on the left, that is a flightless cormorant. And you can see the wings have been sort of mutated. Um, 
Let's see if I can admit somebody here. Uh, the wings have been mutated and they look like little vestiges of what their true wings were before, what we see in the Cormorants where we live. And they essentially use them now as for balance when they hop around on the rocks. They nest right on the rocks next to the ocean. They don't nest in trees. And they use those wings to hop around. Their legs are really thick and muscular and they're great divers. Their favorite food is octopus. They like to dive down and look into the crevices for octopus. And of course, another endemic species are marine iguanas. These are the only true marine iguanas. In Florida, you might see iguanas swimming from a mangrove to a mangrove, but these iguanas actually dive into the ocean for food. They feed on algae. And you can see in that upper uh, corner, they put their, their appendages against their body and they use their tail, which is somewhat flattened, as a paddle. And that's how they swim. They can dive down to something like 45 feet. They can stay underwater for half an hour or more. Um, and, but they, they do have a little diet problem because they feed on algae, they have excess salt. And so when they're sitting out there sunbathing, they're cold blooded and they're warming up, they can actually, they actually spend a lot of time sneezing salt out of their noses. That's how they get rid of the excess salt. And when you get closer to them, they start sneezing a little bit more. So it's a little bit disgusting. <laughs> it's kind of funny though. Um, and, but one of the most amazing things is when you see them underwater. Seeing a marine iguana underwater, it just looks wrong. They look like little dinosaurs. And it's just amazing. Also, the Galapagos are well known for hammerhead sharks. They have Galapagos sharks, uh, white tips, uh, black tips. It's really an amazing place. Uh, manta rays, you see here also a um, king angelfish in the upper right and one of my favorite sea stars in the Galapagos the chocolate chip sea star. And it really does look like a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> um, also amazing landscapes. Here you see this, they have a puntia cactus that grow almost, they grow as tall as trees on some of the islands. The cactus in the lower one is called a lava cactus. It's what, what we call a pioneer plant, one of the very first plants that can colonize the lava and start creating soil to bring in other vegetation. And one of my favorite landscapes is that one on the right where you see an old, uh, a series of scoria cones. Scoria is a volcanic fragment that's about this big there. So they're little pebbles, volcanic pebbles, and you see cones of those pebbles. And then after that eruption, another eruption was a pohoihoi lava flow that went through the scoria cones. It kind of looks like the landscape on Mars or something. Sometimes you see truly unbelievable things. When uh, one of the naturalists came to us with this picture of a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana, and we thought he had photoshopped it. We're like, no way, that cannot be a real picture. But yes, probably only time you'll ever see a picture of a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And then that other, the other picture is something called kelvin hemholtz waves. And these are unusual cloud formations that form as air is rising over that island. It's warming up over the island, it rises, and then it hits a, a section in the atmosphere where the wind is going across the, way, uh, the clouds and it's shearing off the tops. And so you get these very special way, uh, clouds. And so now lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the things that I love doing is integrating science and nature into the books that I write, whether they're obviously if they're nonfiction, but also into fiction. And so my latest Fiction for middle graders is called Escape Galapagos, the first book in what's going to be called The Wonderlist Adventures. And so I'm going to just show you some of the really fun things I, I incorporated into the story. One thing I'm going to do in all the books is put a map. And, um, oh, and I love maps. I think it's really important that we show kids maps. So every book like this one is going to have a map. Um, hold on. And, um, so this is the one we put in the Galapagos one. Um, the, in the beginning of the book starts with a scene with a marine iguana walking through a sand castle. And I actually saw that on a beach one day and I just couldn't help but put that in because it reminded me of this, Godzilla. So the first chapter is called Godzilla Sneezes. Because doesn't that look like Godzilla? It's too funny. Um, some other things on the book, I've got some, real, some sea turtles, white tip sharks, and this really funny scene in the book where the main character who's actually afraid of wild animals has to go onto a, an island and there's a big sea lion sleeping and she hears going, <sighs> hear it snoring. And she's like, oh my gosh, it's snoring. And there's actually sea lion jewel coming out of its mouth. And that really happened. That's a picture of, we were out hiking and there was a sea lion and I heard this weird noise. I'm like, what the heck is that? 
it was a sea lion sleeping, snoring, and there was sea lion jewel coming out of its mouth. So, of course, middle grade, I had to put that in. Um, there's a great scene with the, they find this cave and they go into a cave and it turns out it's a lava tunnel. In the Galapagos, like Hawaii and other volcanic areas, places where you had lava flowing underground and once the lava stops flowing, you can get these giant tubes. And in the, in the Galapagos, there's places where you can go hiking through the tubes. And when I went there in the 1980s, there was a guy who you pay like, I think you pay like a dollar to get in and he handed you a flat flight and you walk through. Now it's a little more, it's a little better than that now, but. So there's a great scene in the book where they're in the lava tube and it starts to get hotter and hotter and they say, uh, can new lava ever flow down old lava tubes? And of course you can imagine what happens, the lava starts coming and they, they have to run away from it. Um, so one of my very favorite parts of these books is, is in the back, I have a section called Real Versus Made Up. And there's a series of them where I ask the question, which of these things did I, are real from the Galapagos and which are made up? And then there's, a, so then, a, then there's another section where it gives you the answers. So I'll just read you a couple and you can all think, see what you think. So I'll just read a couple. Here's one. Someone once tried to smuggle iguanas out of the Galapagos and was caught when the luggage started moving. Rio versus made up. That's real. Somebody actually put iguanas in their duffel bag and tried to go through the airport and they got arrested when their duffel bag started moving. <laughs> okay, ready? There are giant tortoise tunnels that go from the lowlands up to the highlands. Real versus made up. I made that up. You can see sort of where the tortoises have gone through the brush, but there aren't tunnels in, in the book. The characters end up crawling through them. You can't, you can't really do that. Okay, here's one. A hawk dropped a snake on a visiting hiker. Real? This is made up. You probably got that one. It's real. That really did happen. Thank God it wasn't me. Okay, last one. A woman fell onto a carpet of marine iguanas when her walking stick broke. Real versus made up. That's real. So, and I was actually there. We were walking at the site where there's literally a carpet of marina guanas. We were going across it and this elderly woman had a walking stick and her walking stick broke in half and she literally did a nosedive into the marina guanas. And everybody was like, oh my God, oh no, oh no. She literally stood up wash the, you know, brush the dirt off her clothes and said, my, they're rather soft. <laughs> it, was, it was the funniest thing. We couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really excited. I've had so much fun with this book. Um, it came out last year. I also got a grant from the Edith and uh, Curtis and Edith Munson, Munson Foundation. The, res the response from the book from kids, their parents, from educators has been so much fun. And I think it's a great way to learn. And thank you to the Curtis Neath Munson Foundation. For any of you that would like a copy for free, you can just email Jenny your mailing address and I will send you a copy as long as you agree to write a review on Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Nobles. I would just ask you because it's a very small nonprofit publisher and they specialize in books for educators and, and things that are, are bring science to kids. Um, so we don't have a lot of visibility and marketing power. And so I would just ask you, with the foundation grant, I'm happy to send you guys books, um, but I would just ask that you would you know, write a review and help get the word out. So if you send an email to Jenny, I mean, with your mailing address, I will send each of you a, a signed book, which I would love to do. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jenny. Thanks so much. And we're going to try and do some questions. So first off, let me stop sharing and then get to Jenny, I think, and make you the coat. Changing the, there you go. There you go. It's working. It's working. All right. I'm back up.
Fantastic. Oh, that was so exciting. Oh, I love hearing about the Galapagos. Now I want to go back. <laughs> all right. So thank Oh, I know. And I, I was like jotting all kinds of stuff down. I am wearing my blue footed booby earrings this morning. <laughs> so I felt excited there. Um, so I did put my email address down in the chat box. So past president at femzy.org. Um, feel free to email me. Um, if you can do that by the end of the week, that'd be great. So we can kind of do this in a timely manner. Um, so let's talk questions. I know there were several questions. Um, let me see if I can get back up to some of those in the chat box as you were talking. Well, and while she's looking at that, if anybody has one, you, you can probably you know, raise your hand or unmute your mic for a little bit and we can try and take some that way too while you're looking. Perfect. Um, yeah, so, so Sus Susan, do you want to one? You want to do a couple where we can get them, Susan Shepherd. I can see you have your hand up. Yeah, you described um, different animals um, having different seasons at the Galapagos, and of course, so many of us would love to go um, sometime in our lifetime when things lighten up in terms of travel. So my question is really. Um, I guess there's no ideal time to visit because it's probably amazing anytime. But if you were telling your closest friend, you know what the best time to go? So just be, just between you and me, Susan. No, I'm sure nobody else is listening. No one's listening. No one okay, you guys. Nobody else oh. can go except so, if so we're all going together. There are seasons. Yeah. So from January, February, March, it's very hot. Um, it can be a little bit rainy, and the water, but the water's warm. But it can be hot for hiking. And so if you don't like hot hiking and heat, um, then it's probably not the best time to go, although the water's warm for snorkeling. Then August, September, um, that's sort of a cooler time. It's a little bit windier. Um, it's kind of misty sometimes, but it's beautiful for hiking. The water can be kind of chilly. And, and most operators give you wetsuits, so that helps, but it is the water is chilly. Personally, I like going the in-between seasons, like May, June, or November, December, January, sort of in-between those extremes is when I, I like. You're going to see almost everything year-round. So um, it's not a matter of, you know, what you want to see. The only, the only thing that, that doesn't pertain to is the albatross, because they're only there from December to May and only on Española Island. Okay. okay. But... I like, I do like those in between times. So if you're a warm water lover. Then I would go like uh, January through maybe June. Got it. Maybe another year. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Very good. Um, Marjorie had asked while you were talking, um, have you seen roseate spoonbills in the Galapagos? No, there are no roseate spoonbills in the Galapagos. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I see them here, though. I see them in Florida. They're beautiful birds. Yes, for sure. Um, and then Rachel had said, which type of spe um, speciation is the flightless cormorant an example of? Speciation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an adaption. So... Remember, they're adapting to their environment. So they're not, um, you know, it's not, it, it's not like you think of something evolving to a completely different species in terms of, um, it, it, yeah, it's a very specialized, it's a very specialized way. All I can tell you it's through adaption. I'm not sure if you're looking for a specific term for that. But it's, it's, again, because they lost the need to fly. So their wings just, they, want, they didn't need to fly, so they mutated. And a follow-up that, for that one, Jennifer asked, are they expected for the flightless cormorants to evolve their wings to look more like um, penguins? Oh, that's a good question. Will their wings look more like penguins? I don't know. You know, the penguins, the penguins use the wings to to swim, right? They essentially fly underwater. The cormorants use their feet. They have very strong legs and feet and they're very strong swimmers. So 
I, you know, I don't think so. I think, I wonder if, I wonder, you wonder if they'll get smaller or they'll probably change somehow, but I don't think they'll ever become like the penguin wings because again, the penguins use their wings to fly underwater. So that's how they swim. Whereas the cormorants are using their legs and feet. And they're really good swimmers. Um, Marcy has her hand up and I guess would like to ask a question. Go ahead and turn your microphone on, Marcy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, I, I also just put my, uh, put my question in the chat box there, but um, well, thanks so much, Ellen. That was really great. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the regulations for the cruise lines, like the, the ships and, and the land-based excursions that folks go on in order to protect um, the, the different wildlife and the ecosystems there on the island? Sure, that's, that's a great question, Marcy. So I have to say, I think they have one of the best systems in the world in terms of protecting the islands and the wildlife. So you cannot go on any island without a naturalist, a licensed Galapagos Park naturalist. You can't have any more than 16 people per naturalist. You have to stay on the trails and they're, they're well marked. You cannot go off the trails. You can't bring food on the islands. You can't get any closer than six feet. And I think one of the reasons this works really well is because if a naturalist is out there with a group and they see somebody doing something wrong, like out there without a naturalist or going off, it's part of their job to, re to report it. And if they don't, they can lose their license. And so there's a great incentive to keep all those rules working. And they, they also, um, they, you know, they obviously value conservation of the Galapagos, and so they want to protect it. I mean, every single piece of litter, anything that's there, everybody picks up, everybody does everything. Um, and again, the, the, the ships can't have any more than 100 passengers, and they have to follow all the rules. Even a private ship, if a private boat comes in, they have to get a permit, and they have to hire naturalists. And not only that, the park tells you where you go, what you can do and when you can go there. So like if we get to a site and people wanna go snorkeling, but on our permit, we don't have snorkeling, we can't go. And so it's very well controlled. They also keep overcrowding down that way so that they organize it. So like if you have a ship with a hundred passengers and you're gonna visit a smaller island, they make sure there's no other, you know, hundred passenger ship there at the same time as you are. So it, it's, I think it's really well done in, in terms of, an, and I will admit that sometimes we get passengers who are not happy about all the rules. They want to just wander on their own and, you know, do their own thing, but it's really working. And so we, you know, we really, it's, it's very strict, at least for celebrity, we are very careful about those rules. Right. Yeah. It's, so it's not like these massive giant cruise ships leaving out of Miami, you know, that no, you no, no, you can't have any more than a hundred. That's maximum. And now I even wonder, you know, obviously they're going to have to rethink some of that. Mm -hmm. for a while at least. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Very good. Um, Jennifer asked if there is any impact of oceanic pollution on the species in the Galapagos. Um, one thing we definitely see is plastics. I mean, we still get the, we see turtles and the sea turtles and the sea lions get caught up in fishing line and in plastic. And the rule in the Galapagos is, if it's a natural problem, you can't interfere. Like during El Nino's, that upwelling that I talked about is shut down. And a lot of what happens is productivity in the islands really decreases and you get starving sea lion pups. They don't do well. The marine iguanas die. Um, but one cool thing about the marine iguanas, when their food source gets low, they can actually shrink their bones to survive better, which is really cool. Um, but you can't do anything about that. Like if you see an animal starving, you can't do anything. But if you see an, angle, an animal tangled up in plastic, you're allowed to try and free it or you call the park and they'll come out and try and free it. So we see that um, in, they, they have had some problems in the towns with oil spills, but that's only in the town areas, not in the open sort of other where most of the animals are. Um, and of course, we don't really know what's going to happen with climate change. I mean, that's not, you can think of that as temperature pollution, but we're, it's not clear in the Galapagos what's going to happen with climate change. But plastics and trash are, are the biggest issue, I would say, in terms of pollution there. And, and it's not very bad. I mean, it's, it's pretty rare that you see that. Very good. 
All right, Stephanie Soto asked, has anyone studied fungi in the Galapagos? Um, I watched an amazing fungi documentary on Curiosity Stream that mentioned how they basically help bring ecosystems back after huge natural disasters and their previous symbiotic relationships with algae. So I don't specifically know. There are a lot of lichens in the Galapagos. One of the, there's a really interesting uh, sort of a symbiosis with some lichens. They have a plant called a Palo Santo tree or incense tree. And the lichens grow over the bark and it acts as like sunscreen and they help protect it from drying out because there are a lot of places that don't get a lot of water, a lot of rain. And so the plants need to conserve water. And one of the ways they do this is the lichen grows over the bark and it actually, it helps the plant from desiccating out. It keeps it moisture. And so I don't know about fungi, and I don't know if anybody's even looked for fungi, but I know there are a lot of lichens. One of the interesting things also about the Galapagos is things that you think might be there, there aren't a lot of. Like, for instance, there aren't a lot of insects. There aren't a lot of mammals. Because remember, the only way for animals to get there typically are to be, you know, you're 600 miles from the clo closest mainland. So we think a lot of animals come on rafts of debris or get caught up in storms, but there's very few insects, which is sort of interesting. You don't have a lot of beetles um, and not that many mammals. And again, that's because of the remote nature and how the animals have to get there. So I don't know about fungi. <laughs> All right, uh, Reese is interested in where she can go to dive with hammerheads. Um, well, there's a couple places. Typically there's a place called Gordon Rocks where I've been diving and we had a school of hammerheads circling us. It was really cool. It wasn't frightening at all. They were just curious and they were circling us. So Gordon Rocks is a place near Santa Cruz where you can go. And then also Wolf and Darwin Islands, which are up to the north. There you can sometimes see schooling hammerheads. So those are two places I would definitely recommend. Does celebrity go to either of those places? No, we don't do any scuba diving. We only do snorkeling. You have to, if you're going to scuba dive, my recommendation is either go on a liveaboard or go to some, go to Santa Cruz and there's, there's like an operator called Scuba Iguana or one of the operators. But um, logistically, we just can't do it off of our ships. We, but we do a lot of snorkeling and the snorkeling is fantastic. I will say if you're a scuba diver, just remember, it's going to be cold water. There's a strong thermocline. And so even if, it's, even if it's warm on the surface, it's much colder at the bottom and there can be very strong current. So it's not really for beginners. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline Dracos asked, um, what has been your favorite dive or dive experience in the Galapagos? Uh, my favorite dive or dive experience. Um, let's see. I think... I think playing with sea lions, whether I'm diving or snorkeling, you can't, there's just, okay, here, I'll tell you guys, I'll tell you another secret. Don't tell anybody. You get to the Galapagos and you're out there and some pups come or juveniles. If you dive down, if you're, if you're um, snorkeling, if you dive down and you sort of twirl around in somersault, they will come play with you. They'll come circle with you in somersault. It's the coolest thing. Um, so playing with sea lions, and then I will say, just like we've seen in California recently, I was diving at night and there was a lot of bioluminescence. And when the sea lions would come by, you could see a trail of dinoflagellates, you know, sparkling behind them. So that was pretty cool too. So I don't know, I, had, I say that and then I'll think about, oh, one time a humpback whale and the, and the calf dove under our zodiac. Uh, I don't, you know, penguins feeding underneath me. I, I don't know, it's hard to pick. Fantastic. Okay. Um, it's, uh, Alicia Torres says, can you tell us more about the programs on the cruise lines? Are they all science-based? So, no, obviously, I'm in, well, okay. They're, they're all, they all use the Galapagos Park Naturalists who are all trained in science. But what I would say is that some of the cruise lines supplement that with more. For instance, part of my job is to train the naturalists beyond what they get from the park. And certainly Lindblad and National Geographic do the same thing. They have a, a ship, one or two ships there too. Um, I would say the bigger, the bigger lines do, I think Celebrity and National Geographic Lindblad are probably the two top ones for that. Um, the mom and pop operations with the small ones don't necessarily do that unless 
you schedule it with a tour or with a tour leader who works with the Galapagos National Park uh, licensed uh, naturalists and specifically go for that. Um, but they don't all do, do they don't all go beyond what the naturalists are going to tell you about. And from experience, there's a wide range of expertise in the naturalist. One of the things I work with is to make sure we get the best ones possible and their science is right. Because some of the naturalists are not that well trained and they, their science is a little iffy. So you want to go with, with somebody who you know you're going to get the right stuff. All right, that is all of the questions from the chat box. Does anybody have anything else? If so, you can either raise your hand or turn on your microphone and uh, we'll do maybe one or two more questions unless everybody's good. I see one there's Candace has one. Yeah, so um, going back to the mammals getting onto the island, how did the goats get on the island? Oh, the goats came with the pirates and the whalers. They were introduced purposefully, um, you know, on the islands for milk and food. But what happened is they, they got, you know, they overtook some of the islands. In fact, they've had a big, uh, a big program to eradicate the goats on the islands because they've, you know, and in some, some of the islands, they've gotten rid of all of them because they were out competing the native species, particularly the giant tortoises, and they were eating all the vegetation. So they have eradicated a lot of the goat problem, but it's not only goats, it's rats, feral cats, donkeys are actually a problem on one of the islands. Oh um, so, yeah, invasive species, there are also invasive wasps. So invasive species are a big problem in the Galapagos, and most, almost all of them come on ships, you know, or mm. were either purposely introduced or by mistake by humans, yep. Oh, thank you. Sure. I guess we do that, don't we? Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, here's another question down in the chat box from Susan. Um, have you created any middle school science lessons to go along with your book? Awesome question. Oh, that's a great question, Susan. So I haven't done any specific lessons, but um, I know teachers who have. So. I had this great teacher who was reading it to her classroom and they were making, um, they were doing journals as she read and they were doing projects on the animals. They also had to write their own characters in. They had to uh, do research projects. They had to look at conservation in the Galapagos. So while I haven't developed any myself, I know teachers who are using the book have created their own Pretty, pretty simple things that were very effective. The kids loved it. They had so much fun and they sent me, it was great. They sent me pictures of some of the animals they drew and you know, some of us came up with alternate endings. And so yeah, I haven't created them, but um, which I did mention also, I am right now about to finish the first draft of the second book in the series. And again, okay, we won't tell anybody else. It is called Escape Greenland. The second book takes place in Greenland, and it's going to have the same thing in the back um, where it have real versus made up, and a lot of it is about climate change and how glaciers and ice sheets melt. Um, and so I think it will, it will lend itself to the exact same thing where either some lessons can be created um, or people can come up with it on their own. Again, I, um, I have it myself, but, but I know teachers are doing that already. And Thank you. Yeah. And last question, um, why, uh, what should I tell students who want to pursue a career in marine science? What experience is important to begin with and what kind of training? So for students who are interested in marine science, first thing is if you work hard, you can do anything. Um, I didn't know any marine scientists. You know, I watched Jacques Cousteau as a kid and all that, but I didn't know anybody. So um, they have to get a solid background in science from high school and up, biology, physics, chemistry, you know, I did geology, geology math, um, solid background in science, but added to that uh, is get experience by working in an aquarium or a nature center or um, with some sort of a school program. Try and get some experience out, you know, connecting with experts or people that they can learn from. So basic science, try and get some experience. And a couple things I, I, I always really emphasize is be proactive, look for experiences out there. There are so many good programs now at museums, summer camp, there are so many great 
summer camps out there. Look for experiences, go after, look for internships, volunteer at you know, home. And don't be afraid to ask. You know, sometimes students are afraid to ask for opportunities, but I always tell students, if somebody says no to you, it's not because of you as a person, it may be, you know, that opportunity is just not there, but work hard in, in school, take a, a wide range of science classes, because then you can go on in science late, you know, specifically in marine biology or oceanography later, but you need a solid science background to begin. And then look for, for great experiences where you can meet people and ask for opportunities. All right, very good. Thank you so much for all the questions and thank you, Dr. Prager, for sharing your expertise. We appreciate it. Um, for everyone that is here, don't forget, if you would like a copy of the book, you can email pastpresidentfmz.com uh, or .org, sorry, .org. Um, my email address is in the chat box. Just make sure you click on it before you go. Um, also, don't forget to renew your FEMSI membership. Usually our membership automatically happens when you renew for, or when you join for the conference. And since there was no conference, there's no way to do that. So if you go to FEMSI.org, you can um, go ahead and make sure you get that conference or the, sorry, the membership renewed. And if you enjoyed today's session, we hope you'll consider donating to FEMSI. I added the donation link at the top of the chat box at the beginning. Um, most of our funding comes from our annual conference and we would really like um, for you guys to participate if you can. I know it's a, str a tr struggling time for everyone. Um, and finally, don't forget about the next session, which is this afternoon. We're going to do kind of our annual board meeting that we have every Saturday um, night during the off during the conference. Um, so if you can join that, we would appreciate it. And I guess this is it. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>